Welcome everyone to Meditation Mount. We're here in the Ojai Valley, which is in Southern California. I'm delighted that you are joining us today and we'll be exploring the theme, divine duality and the natural urge to create. So let's begin as we normally do by taking a few moments to gather ourselves, to bring ourselves present and to create a collective field of communion and community in which to inquire the way together. And we do that simply by taking a few slow, deep breaths, releasing any tension that may be held in the physical body, breathing out any tension that may be held in the emotional body. And then breathing out any extraneous thoughts that may be swirling in the mind. Release all tension and allow a state of inner stillness and serenity to show up. And then together we step into the silent and sacred space of the heart. And we become aware of an eternal flame burning in the center of our heart. This is the fire of love that lives at the heart of all creation. It's what joins us together, it's what we have in common, the fire of love. So let us consciously connect heart to heart to heart to heart and weave together a lighted matrix of love. And into this group chalice, we invite the entry of new wisdom. We invite the entry of lighted particles of understanding to come from the deeper dimensions of life to enter our awareness and to bring illumination today. Thank you. So I'm going to be exploring with you and Together we're going to be exploring divine duality and the natural urge to create. And I've heard it said about life in general, there is only one urge, one desire in the whole of creation, in the whole universe. That is the desire of the creator to know itself, to touch itself, to be itself. This deep desire for life to reveal and to express itself in multitudinous ways so that this one life finds limitless ways of expressing its splendor, its promise, its potential. That's one way of describing the urge that lies in creating things, bringing new things to life. So if we go back to this, the original intent held in the mind and heart of the Creator, now, maybe that's not absolutely accurate. Maybe that's just how we're translating it in human terms. But for me, it puts me in touch with the great urge to be, the urge to know, the urge to realize oneself. And that's really what we're going to be exploring today. So divine duality and the natural urge to create. So in order to prime the pump and seed the field for this group inquiry, I want to start with a statement that expounds on this theme. And I'll read it. All that we see around us is the result of a co-creative process 
and the ageless wisdom teaching states that the manifested universe is a child born out of the consummation of a sacred communion between the divine feminine and the divine masculine aspects of the one life. So this dual origin, according to the Agni Yoga tradition, constitutes the two poles of the cosmic magnet functioning as the generative agent of creation. So what we're saying is that life uses its twofold nature, it utilizes it to give birth to itself. And if we are, as it said in the scriptures, made in the image and likeness of the creator, then that same thing happens inside of us. So inside of each person, it's said there lives a corresponding soul magnet. And this magnet has its own dual nature, its own two poles, the masculine and the feminine. So I wanted to just offer that as a, a foundation. This is the nature of our essential self. The reason I say that is because all of us are on this quest to find out who we are, to search and reveal, express our inner identity. And we end up in lots of different classrooms. And I found that recently, something that's come into the frame that makes it a little bit more challenging for people, particularly when you're talking about the inner duality of masculine and femininity, femininity. So you've got masculinity, femininity, you've got the feminine and masculine poles. A lot of people are struggling on the outside with gender issues and gender identity. So this is front and center in this exploration to discover, uncover, and recover what I call our sovereignty, our sense of self. So this quest to know who we are is being played out everywhere on the planet, homes, community centers, streets, everywhere. And we know that some people feel really at home in the skins in which they were born. Others feel that they are wearing strange clothes. These are not the clothes that correspond to what I feel like inside. And so we have a, a huge spectrum of exploration going on. We have people who are gender fluid, gender neutral. We have trans. We have people who stand in different places on this rainbow continuum of preference and choice. I believe that whatever color we relate to and wherever we stand on this rainbow continuum, it makes no real difference. Because the ageless wisdom teachings explain that despite any outer differences, we do share the same inner geometry, or what I like to call the same soul circuitry, namely the divine duality of masculine and feminine qualities. So I'm working on this premise that um, we're made in the image and likeness of the creator. And if this whole of creation came out of the sacred marriage of these two aspects of the one, then that's mirrored in us, that's reflected in us. And therefore, how we create is by bringing these two aspects into a dynamic, positive, powerful relationship. Because when we do that, we give birth to what's inside of us. Our gifts can freely flow. And we can then move into a role which I would call co-creators, divine artisans of life. So. We're not just here to survive and get by. We're here to participate in the ongoing and continuous process of creation and revelation. I know that's a, a big statement, and sometimes it's hard to grasp that when we're dealing with the daily challenges to realize that I, we, are an active principle and part of the story of creation, which is ongoing. It didn't just begin with the, the creation of the world and then it stopped. It's an ongoing story of which we're a part of. So I'd love us to explore what I call the profound mystery of creation and also look at some of the requirements for bringing these two parts of our essential nature into a sacred marriage so that our soul may express itself. 
So let's just reflect on this a little more. If the created universe is truly a child born out of the consummation of a sacred communion between the divine feminine and the divine masculine, and if we are fractals of the one life, then the eternal cosmic story of creation is being played out through our temporal nature, through our personal daily lives. And we're reminded of that spiritual axiom that says, as above, so below. Everything's mirrored. Everything is part of a nested universe. For instance, inside of me, inside of you, is the universe of self. All the lives that look to us for well-being, look to us for stewardship, look to us as the creator, as the person who's going to bring nourishment, as the father and the mother to our universe. And then inside of that, that universe, the universe of self, or the ecosystem of self, lives inside the ecosystem of our one humanity, which lives inside the planetary ecosystem, which lives inside the solar ecosystem. So you have this notion of lives within lives within lives, the nested reality. Therefore, at every level we find ourselves on, the same patterns are being played out, the same creative agents are at work. So to go back to what we showed in the slide earlier about the dual origin, we can say that the one unmanifest life utilizes its twofold nature to give birth to itself. And as I've just hinted, that when we look at our own soul with its component parts of the masculine and feminine, we realize that we are divine fractals. We actually get to experience the macrocosm the macrocosmic act of creation can be experienced inside the daily microcosm of the human experience. I mean, that's where, as above, so below, that's when we realize that we go about our lives each day and we're acting out the same great cosmic drama, the desire of the one life to reveal the truth, the goodness, and the beauty of who it is and what it is. So just a few words on creation. I mean, this is a big thing. Um, and there are creation stories, and a lot of the indigenous cultures have their own creation stories. And whether it's a being that gave birth to it, whether it's a being that sang it into being, the song, whether it's the flute, the voice, there is always this story of something is called forth. So creation really is how the invisible becomes visible. It's how the no thing, or nothing, becomes the something. So people say, oh, it's nothing, as though it means it doesn't exist. Well, it doesn't exist as a manifested form, but at the deeper level of its potential, a no thing is as real as a something, in my books. So creation is the process by which the one shows up as the many aspects of itself. We've sort of talked about this before. Each one of us is one of those many aspects. And the Greek philosophers understood that. And there was this wonderful phrase that really used to confuse me until I understood what it was hinting at. Everything is contained in everything. And you think, well, what does that mean? what well, means that everything is contained in everything. And there are people who have said, like the ocean. You think of the ocean, it's made up of billions and billions of droplets of water. However, inside of every droplet of water is the ocean. So the one and the many, everything is contained within everything. And so you have this, the one and the many expressions of itself. And I always go back to the Bhagavad Gita, one of the ancient texts. And this wonderful phrase that says, having pervaded the universe with a fragment of myself, yet I remain. So this one life, having put itself inside of us, inside of all creation, still remains as its own beingness. And yet it doesn't know itself until it's met itself. And it meets itself when the many come home to the one. That's called the path of return. 
That's the story of the prodigal son, the prodigal daughter, coming back to the father's house, as it says in the Bible. So we have this one life, that which remains, if you go back to this statement from the Bhagavad Gita, having pervaded the universe with a fragment of myself, yet I remain. So when I was pondering on this, I thought, well, that which remains and exists everywhere and every when is known as God transcendent. It's God everywhere, creator everywhere, whatever name you choose to call it. And that aspect of the one that now lives inside the focused and particular world of the many is referred to as God immanent, I-M-M-A-M-E-N-T, not immanent as about to happen, although I believe the, the immanent is, is, is imminent. And so the immanent and the transcendent create this dynamic dance. And this gives rise to evolution. It's that which pulls us forward. So the deep longing of the creator inside of me relates to the deep longing of the creator that still remains and yet still lives inside the many. This is part of the mystery. I, I don't think I want to give, oh, this is what it is. I'm just hinting at my exploration and it's more a sense of belonging. I belong to this great mystery called life and I am connected. I am part of life. And so you, when you think about the journey, the evolution of consciousness, it's the journey of self-realization. And I want to quote from another ancient text. Some of you may be familiar with an ancient prayer called the Gayatri. And there are some lines in there that say, lead us from darkness to light, from the unreal to the real, and from death to immortality. That seems to be the trajectory that we're on. So anyway, you can hear all of this at this great grandiose level on the story of creation of the universe and this divine dance of duality could feel somewhat removed and distant from your daily life until we realize that the great mystery is playing out each day in our daily lives. If we were to let it in, a lot of the time we're in survival mode. We're not in creative mode. When you're in survival mode, it's all about how can the self get by. When you're in creative mode, it's how can I participate in this greater act of revelation. So I believe that each of us are being invited to wake up and to participate in what I would call the continuous process of regeneration as fractals of the one life. So each of us is being invited to explore the mystery of the divine union through all our various relationships that we're in. First of all, there's the relationship with self. Then there's the relationship with others. Then there's the relationship with the multi-dimensional ecosystem. Some of it is visible to our eyes, some of it is not. But what we need to realize is all of this, all of the relationships that we're part of, offer us a first-hand experience in the microcosm of the macrocosm. So through the daily learning lab of human experience, as above, so below, we get to touch in to what's really happening at the heart of creation. So this is where I need to take a deep breath because I believe we're embarked on an awesome journey of self-realization through relationship. Consciousness only happens through relationship. Illumination only happens through relationship. The fact that you are watching this on a device with a liquid crystal screen and you can see light. Where did the light come from? The light came from this tension in the differential field between positive and negative, between masculine and feminine, if you'd like to draw that correlation. So we understand at a basic technical level, the electric light came out of this tension between masculine and feminine, between positive and negative poles. And therefore it's said that enlightenment has to come out of this divine relationship 
not just in ourselves, but the divine relationship with each other. So all of this really is part of what I call the quest for meaning and belonging. It's said that these are the two basic needs and characteristics of being human. We're on a quest for meaning. I mean, why am I here? What's life about? And belonging, that I'm not an isolated unit, a separated island. I'm part of something greater. So the question of who am I is prevalent in our lives. And I believe this question of who am I, where do I fit in, etc., is the inner propellant that moves us onward and upward upon the spiral path of evolution. So let's look at a slide now that describes very simply, this is my take on what evolution is. So evolution of consciousness, it should say, occurs naturally through a progressive revelation and entry into greater states of wholeness, identity, and embodiment. By surrendering to and embracing this continuing process of disidentification, re-identification, and renewal, we experience an expanded sense of self. And that's the whole thing. An expanded sense of self. It's always growing. So as the illusion of separation dissolves, when we realize that no person, no man is an island, as it said, it reveals what I call the divine intimacy and interdependency of life, which is the great mystery in which we live and move and have our being. And when we get that, at this point, there seems to arise a deep knowing that in our blood and bones, in our essence, we are fractals of the one life that there is no separation, there is no difference. We're just a different dimensional expression of the one. And then out of this great mystery, something new and more joyful is seeking to be born through each of us. And what I call the birth that is seeking to play, take place is the birth of a greater love. It's the birth of what a number of people are referring to now as the divine child. And the divine child is born inside the womb of an open and loving heart. So if you look at this divine child throughout history, it's been portrayed in different ways. Uh, in Christianity, it was the Christ child. It's interesting to note that Christos and Christic, these terms predated Christianity so the, the Christos, the, the light of love that's born out of the fusion of divine masculine and divine feminine, goes back into antiquity. And that's really what I believe is, is seeking to be born inside of us at this time. This Christos, this Christic impulse, the light of love is seeking to be born within the cave of the human heart, as it's stated in the Ageless Wisdom teachings. So I'd like to look at masculine and feminine in a slightly different way. I'm going to, in a moment, show you a slide that shows that it's reflected in numbers, in the ones and zeros. And before we see the slide, I just want to say it's no accident that in our modern digital world, everything is built upon the infinite possibilities generated by the marriage of ones and zeros. If you are a programmer, you understand this. And the fact that we're able to broadcast, transmit from the mount, you're able to receive it, it's all based on the marriage of ones and zeros. And so, uh, if we are to use a phrase, the outer always reflects the inner if we have the eyes to see. So I'd love to explore my very simplistic take on ones and zeros now and just see if it resonates with you. The number one represents the seed purpose, the potential and enfolded promise of life. The one indicates and informs the deep destiny and direction of life in the temporal worlds. It is an expression of the divine masculine. So you've got the number one. And this, this number one is the beginning. But it really isn't the beginning because the first number is zero. 
And zero is a very special number. Zero represents virgin space. It's the sacred womb for birthing and expressing all outer manifestations of the one life. Without the zero, without virgin space, creation would not be able to take place. So I call it the fecund field in which the enfolded promise of the seed purpose is nurtured and unfolded through the rhythm of the seasons and cycles. So zero is an expression of the divine feminine. You can even look at this at ones and zeros. The one could represent the sperm. The zero could represent the egg. So when the sperm and the egg meet and merge and manifest, you have in microcosmic human terms a reenactment of how the worlds came into being. For me, it's an awesome mystery, and it's like, wow. And I'd like to just say that these numbers that we've just looked at, the one and the zero, can also be viewed as the line and the circle. And I want to just say a little about that before we move on. So when you think of a circle, and when you think of life, what happens when we were born our bodies grew through cellular division. So you've got the circle bisected by a line, so that's cellular division, so the one becomes the two. And then it's said in the esoteric um, wisdom teachings that this sets up a counter tension at right angles and another division happens. So you've got a, a circle with two lines, a vertical line and a horizontal line as cellular division. And this therefore is the circle with the cross inside. And why I want to mention this is because this is part of the secret of the earth. We've mentioned this in other broadcasts, that the astrological and astronomical symbol for the earth is a circle with a cross inside. And it represents the, the light of the one buried deep inside of matter. So this other duality is spirit and matter. And the cross inside the circle represents spirit buried in matter. And the whole of the intent of the being of this planet is to reveal the hidden light that lives within its substance, its matter. Matter, mata, mother. So we get a sense of this is being played out all the time. And then you realize that when you look at Venus and in the Ages Wisdom teachings, Venus is purported to be a more enlightened planet. Um, there are, and the symbol for Venus is a cross with a circle on the top of the cross. It looks like a flower. In my, in my simple gardening term, oh, it looks like a flower because it's broken free. And so I think we can learn a lot from understanding the symbols, but I just wanted to bring the one and the zero, the line and the sphere, because it's the interplay between these two that, that creates everything we see around us. So let me explore this a little further with you in this next slide, which pertains to the characteristics of a spiral. So the spiral represents the evolutionary arc of consciousness on its path towards self-realization. A spiral is the natural dynamic shape and geometry of all spiritual growth as we journey back to a pre-existing state of oneness. So we know that the spiral is everywhere. Spiralina. Spirals everywhere. That's just what happens. And then I found this notion of the spiral because they said that evolution is an upward-moving virtuous spiral that brings us into greater states of wholeness. I found it useful that when I find myself, as we often say, like in Groundhog Day, we're trapped inside a ceaseless and confining rounds of the circle. We just keep going round, repeating ourselves, how do I get out of this? How do I get out of this? How do I stop the carousel? How do I get off? The way that we break the hold of the circle on us is the intentional application of purpose through an act of will. And the purpose would be the line. And when you apply a line and underneath a circle as 
giving it direction, it directs the energy upwards, it lifts the circle, and the circle turns into a spiral of evolving consciousness. So I found in my own life, when I'm stuck and going round and round in circles, there's nothing wrong with that. But the way that I can understand how to move and to break that entrapment is through an act of will or an act of desire to choose to express something different. I choose to express more of who I am. And then that tension, that striving, which is directional, and the striving is like this arrow, is like this number one, the line. And when the line lifts the circle, we have the spiral. So I find that reassuring that we can always get back on track with the spiral of the evolution by an act of will. And an act of will isn't forcing something. An act of will is choosing clearly the purpose of my life is aligned with the purpose of the greater life in which I live and move and have my being. That for me is a true act of will. It's not coercion and forcing anything. It really is entering into a, a deeper meaning of life and reason for being. So what I'd like to explore as a natural outcome of this, because uh, one of the mysteries that I grew up with because I was raised in a Christian household was the mystery of the virgin birth. And I want to show a few slides on that. But before that, I want to talk about my puzzlement at that time. You know, virgin birth, how did that happen? How does that happen? Nobody could give me a straight answer. Nobody in the church could give me a straight answer. Well, it's a miracle. You know, it's a mystery. Yeah, but what happened? How did Mary get pregnant with Jesus? You know, what happened? Um, so it can be puzzling to truly understand the inner meaning and significance of this virgin birth. And so it's always been something I wanted to explore. And over the last six months, as I started to understand the dynamic relationship between masculine and feminine that wished to take place inside of me, I began to revisit the virgin birth. And I'd like to start out by exploring two characteristics on this next slide. Purity of intent and purity of heart. So this is what it says, purity of intent and purity of heart are required for the birth of a new consciousness. Purity of intent calls forth the fiery seed of purpose that carries the eternal promise of life enfolded within its center. Purity of heart opens the virgin space of an unconditional love that forms the womb of creation and allows for the unfolding of the yet-to-be-revealed promise. And we've said that in slightly different ways earlier today. So when you think of what we said, the enfolded universe, and we've used this example of enfolded, which is a term that David Bohm, the physicist, used. Enfolded means everything is packed into a particle of an infinity. It's its most particular expression. It's a seed. And when you plant a seed in the fields of time and space, the enfolded promise through the seasons, through the cycles, unfolds. So I, in my very simplistic way, like to think of life. My job is to unfold the enfolded promise of who I am. And I do it together with you. I do it together with the birds, the animals, the plants. I do it together with the whole ecosystem. So what I'd like to do is to connect this statement with some insights into the mystery of the virgin birth. So here's what I understand so far. The virgin birth occurs naturally when the pure seed of spirit, which I would call the father or divine masculine principle, enters and impregnates the uncontaminated and unconditioned womb of space, the mother or divine feminine principle. 
So uncontaminated, unconditioned womb of space, that is virgin space. That is the mother, the purity of the mother, the essence of the mother. And then as we've been exploring, from out of the consummation of the sacred communion between these dual aspects of the one life, a new and unique child of consciousness is, in, is born. And then I sort of put two and two together a, a few weeks ago. Um, purative intent represents the masculine principle. Because I intend to do something, go back to that act of will, that, that line that lifts the circle. And purity of heart represents the feminine principle. The purity of heart, inside the heart, the loving heart, new life can be born. So we go back to the conjoining of these principles guarantees the continuous and limitless generative process of the creator to re reveal itself. And I think limitless for me was the key. Um, I'm reading an Agni Yoga book at the moment that's called Infinity. And I, I know those of you who are familiar with Toy Story and Buzz Lightyear is infinity and beyond. But infinity means never ending, the never ending story. It isn't right, now we've created everything that could be created. In some mysterious way, there is no end to the expression of the truth, goodness and beauty that lives inside the one. And, and our 3D minds don't always get, and a lot of people are now talking about moving from 3D to 5D living. You may have bumped into this five-dimensional living. So I'd like to ask a question of myself and of you, because I'm, you may be asking it. Why are we emphasizing the divine feminine principle as being so important at this period in history when you know, we've been clearly stating that the task is to establish a balanced and dynamic relationship between the two poles, the masculine and feminine. There is this emphasis on the divine feminine. So I, I thought about this and I've come up with two possible explanations or perspectives. Firstly, it's obvious that things are wildly out of balance with the domination of what I would call the shadow side of the masculine principle in our recent history. It has contaminated the field. It has poisoned the field. And so th this imbalance needs redressing. Therefore, the divine feminine needs to come in to help redeem some of the effects of a predominantly um, masculine dominated uh, society. I'm not talking about men, women. I'm talking about masculine, feminine as principles. Now, the second reason for focusing on the divine feminine expands everything because we're not just talking about the divine feminine in each of us. We're talking about we're living in an incredibly pivotal time in our human history. And uh, you look around, you read social media, old forms are breaking down everywhere. And a new world is seeking to be born from out of our, what I would call, soul-inspired dreams and heartfelt desires. The heartfelt desire for a more just and joyful society. So we've got this breaking down of an old world and we've got this birth, this expectancy that we can feel of, ah, let's give birth to something greater. And when we need to give birth to something greater, like a new civilization, a new era, we need the divine feminine. We need to be held in the unconditional love of the arms of the mother of the world, whatever images you use. But the divine feminine is that virgin space. Without the virgin space, there is nothing in which to place the seed of our desire for a better future. So I would say that it's obvious that we're standing at a critical threshold of a new birth as one family. And therefore, the divine feminine needs to be present. It needs to infuse and condition our collective psyche. So because I was puzzling, well, why all this? We seem to be overemphasizing the divine feminine when we're really talking about finding the balance between the two inside of us. I think it's both and. We need each of us to find the divine balance of masculine and feminine inside of us so that that natural act of creation can occur, occur. And yet, if we're to give birth to a new society, a world that is represents 
the true desire that lives inside you know, our heart, we need the divine feminine in its most expansive form, which would be the image of the mother of the world. There are, there are many images. Pachamama, Gaia. So in addition to bringing the divine masculine and feminine aspects of essential nature into right resonant relationship, the question is, what else are we required to do at this time? And I'd like to show you know, my understanding of where we're at. Collectively, we find ourselves deep inside a major identity crisis and living in a world that appears to be falling apart, as I just described. I believe we have two tasks to perform. Relieving the pain and suffering induced by a collapsing society while simultaneously dreaming the dream and doing whatever it takes to birth this bright new future together. And then we know that new forms to be truly new must be born out of new thinking so that the new is not simply a presentation of the old that has been repaired, repainted, repolished. It's not the old dressed up. We need a new mythos. And a mythos is a creation story. We need to have a meme, a grand social meme that says, this is what we're going to live by. And this new creation story needs to be based on the principles and qualities of the soul that will guide us through the labor pains of this moment in history and inspire us to build our preferred future together that honors and celebrates all life. So I believe it's this twofold work, relieving the pain and suffering. We can't ignore that. But if we only work on relieving pain and suffering and tend it into the wounded and not plant the seeds of something better, something new and better is not going to grow. That's why we have to do both. Some of us may find ourselves called to relieve the pain and suffering side predominantly in our lives. Others may be called to build the new. It doesn't mean we ignore the pain and suffering. We've got to find out where do we fit in? What are we being called to do? What are we as co-creators? So I know um, recently in our series of podcasts that uh, uh, Joseph Carenza and I have been doing at the Mount, there's a theme that's uh, sort of arisen, what is the theme for the next two years? And we've described it as wake up, shape up, and show up as agents of life. But the question is, how do we do that? So this final slide today really is one way of describing this. We need to dare to liberate ourselves, to release all the patterns, prejudices, doubts and fears still inhibiting the natural flowering of our true self in the Garden of Earth. Surrender and gracefully flow with the process of the continuous unfolding and flowering of your soul. It's easier said than done, and we'll return to the word surrender later, because it's come up again. Joyfully surrender and enter wholeheartedly into the dance of life so that the divine promise of your essential nature, held and safeguarded on the inside, may reveal itself in full splendor on the outside. So those are some of the words that accompany this. So let's just refer back to that. The thing of liberation. Liberation, to be free of something, is a fiery act of choice. It's an act of will. You have to dare to break free, to liberate yourself. You can't just sit in prison and say, I wish I wasn't imprisoned. And the imprisonment can be all the addictive patterns, all the thoughts that we're still chained to. These are not necessarily bad. It's just that they can't hold us back in the end from expressing who we are. So the pursuit of freedom, happiness, the whole thing of liberation, and liberty, the Statue of Liberty. Liberation means the continuous renewal and freedom. Not just freedom from others outside, but freedom from that which may hold us back inside, the inhibiting fears and doubts. 
So this whole thing of surrender, when I surrender, I give up my limited stance. It isn't I, I, I admit defeat. So surrender in spiritual terms, when we let go and say, okay, not my will, but thine, as it said in the Bible, you surrender to that greater aspect that is who we truly are, but is yet to be expressed and revealed. So this whole thing of, of surrender as an act of strength, many people still feel that it's an act of weakness. Oh, you don't surrender, you don't give up. I'm saying you have to give up, but what you're giving up is not your desire to live. What you're giving up is your belief of who you are, your attachment to who you think you are, your attachment to your desires, your addictions. That's what is being let go of. And then when we do that, more of who we are can come through. That goes back to the virgin birth. If we can clear away all the patterns that contaminate our field at the moment, we can create a pure field in which something new can be born. So the virgin birth can happen inside of each one of us to the degree that we clear a space and then, through purity of heart, clear this space and, and, and create a womb. And then, with purity of intent, we bring in a preferred future. We then plant the seed. So the spiritual sperm and the cosmic egg meet inside of us. As above, so below. And for me, the most important thing to realize is that my daily life does count. Everything we do, everything we say, everything that moves through us is part of this cosmic drama at this scalar level. So I believe that more will be revealed to us as we live wholeheartedly into the mystery of creation. I remember the poem by Rilke, you may be familiar with it, it's, it, 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 because people are always looking for answers, and he's basically saying, don't seek for answers, live the question. And as you live the question, one day it will show up. It will give, it be born inside of you, because the question is the quest. So I don't want to give you answers, I want to stimulate the quest we're on. And so I may have presented my understanding of, of this subject, the dance between the divine masculine, divine feminine, the virgin birth. Each of us needs to come to our own deep understanding of what it means for us. Because if we're to give birth to the divine child inside of us, it has to be at that intimate level of self. You, I, have to have inside of us a conscious relationship with those aspects. I can't tell you what to do, you can't tell me what to do, but we can encourage each other, we can invite each other, and then together, once we've gotten our individual act together, we join in a collective task. And our collective task as incarnated souls on earth is to create a more perfect inner and outer union so that the one life may express more of the innate truth, goodness and beauty that constitutes the spiritual DNA of our human lineage. It goes back to that. What is the deep desire that gave birth to everything that's around us, the whole of creation? And what is the deep desire that continues that process of unfoldment and revelation? It's the desire of life to be, to reveal itself. And I believe that the, the quality that is being revealed at this time in creation, the light that is being revealed as the new truth is the truth of love. And I, it sounds so simplistic, but the more I allow myself to be in love, the more it makes sense. So I'll, I'll leave you with sort of sharing what I'm pondering on and invite you to go deep yourself with others, with your, in your own reflections, because we are here to give birth to something greater, something more beautiful. And we can only do it if we wake up, if we shape up, if we show up. And if those 
aspects inside of ourselves, the masculine and feminine, really get to know each other and they rise in love. And when they rise in love together, something new and more resplendent is born. So I'm going to take a deep breath now. I've been moving along with you for a while. So thank you so much for your presence and your participation. We'll have another view from the Mount in June. It'll be around the new moon on Sunday, June the 18th. And we'll send out particulars about that. But I want us to stay with the energy that um, we've been exploring today. How does the feminine and masculine, regardless of where we stand on this rainbow continuum of preference and choice as far as gender, how does this inner reality, this inner relationship, how does it look like and feel like inside of each one of us now? Because that's the true relationship that we have to heal. And then we have to utilize to give birth to something greater. And we give birth because it's our, it's our privilege to contribute to the good of the whole. So from all of us here at Meditation Mount, from, from Joseph, Joey, who's on the technical end and the, the person behind the screens making all this possible, from the two of us and all the staff and volunteers here at Meditation Mount, we bid you a warm farewell and a sweet good night. So namaste. We salute the divinity in each of us. <laughs>